Thank you for joining us as Levi continues our study on the Book of Beginnings, the first book of Moses called Genesis. Need to hear some things? So I'm going to break this down for you guys. So we've been going through Genesis. We've been in Genesis since 2019. <laughs> All right, so we're breaking it down verse by verse, precept by precept, book by book, this whole thing. Um, we're going to cover only verse 7 today. One verse. One verse this whole thing. Now, to give you guys, again, an idea of what's happening at this time, Genesis 26, uh, we're looking at it through the lens of what's called the Anamundi calendar or the world calendar. So you have B.C., you have A.D., but we're looking at it at this calendar that is a calendar that counts from the day that Adam was created, all right? So according to the Anamundi calendar, this chapter starts out in the year 2123, and we'll end in 2148, all right? So it covers a period of 25 years, all right? 25 years is what it covers. And so also, remember, Isaac is now doing exactly like Abraham. He's thinking there's a famine. I'm going to go to Egypt. God stops him before he gets all the way to Egypt. He's halfway there. He stays in Gerar. And this famine is exactly 100 years after the famine that Abraham went through, all right? So he, we've talked about him going down there in God's plan. So now we're going to look at verse 7. All right. So let's look at this together. Just one verse. Genesis 26, verse 7. Let me open in prayer. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. I pray that you would speak to us through your word, that you would help us to grow in you, Lord, that you would help us to just be focused on what you have for us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so verse 7 says, uh, And the men of that place, uh, <clears throat> and the men of that place asked about his wife, this is Isaac's wife, and he said, She is my sister. For he was afraid to say, She is my wife, because he thought, Lest the men of the place kill me for Rebecca, because she is beautiful to behold. Now, sound familiar? Dad did the exact same thing. Abraham did the same thing with Sarah when they got to Egypt. Oh, she's my sister. And Abraham was telling a half-truth because was Sarah Abraham's sister? Yeah, it was a half-sister. But here Isaac is blatantly lying because of the fact that he, he, there is no blood relation of a sister here. All right? The closest thing they might be is second cousins. Okay? Now, here's what I want to show you. I, I titled tonight teaching called fear sin curses and freedom all right because i want you guys to see some things so starting off right away to show you guys some information isaac at this time is 75 years old he's 75 years old and rebecca's 48 all right so that's what's going on here so you have this window and again the way we can calculate it that that calendar the animony calendar helps because of the fact you can calculate the, the age and their births and everything, and there's, there's records that are hold that you can read about when they were born and the time frames. Okay, now, so the first thing, if you're taking notes tonight, is this. Here we see Isaac he lies about his wife. It's a blatant lie. He says, she's my sister. And it starts with Isaac not trusting the Lord and escalating to lying. See, okay, so let's, let's put it like this. Did God promise Isaac that he would take care of him? Yes. yes. Did he promise that there would be many descendants out of his line? Yes. And that through him the whole world would be blessed? Just like his father Abraham. And he lied. Mm -hmm. Isaac lies. He doesn't trust the Lord. He lies. And the thing is, is if we don't trust the Lord, we will find ourselves in sin. We will do the same things. And when we let sin come into the situation, sin will escalate even more to dangerous decisions. You have to trust the Lord, what he's doing in your life, how he's he's helping you grow with the situation he's got you in. And, and it could be everything. Like I think of my own life before I was in the military and I was learning to do ministry and training to be a pastor. And I was like, I don't want to live in California. My wife didn't want to live in California, but the Lord had a plan to keep us here. Our plan was to leave California but God had another plan, and we had to trust the Lord through it. And by trusting the Lord, 
here we are at the anchor, and I've been doing ministry since 2011. So you have to trust the Lord and what his plan is, what he's doing with your life, how, how he's showing you to do things. It may not be easy, but you trust him through it, okay? Because you may find some hardships that will come along. Now, the other thing I want you guys to know is this. Fear is a sign of a lack of faith. Fear is a sign of a lack of faith. If you say you have faith in Christ, but you're afraid, you lack trust and you lack that faith towards Christ. Because no matter the situation, whether moving, dating, getting married, changing jobs, changing careers, um, retiring, opening a business, closing a business, you have to seek the Lord on this. Now, some people take this to the extreme. I told you this. Some people take it like, they ask the Lord what they should eat for breakfast. Okay, eat breakfast, you know. But you got to trust the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Fear is a sign of a lack of faith. The second part about this is as a follower of Jesus, there are things we should not entertain. If you are in Christ, if you are following Christ, there are things you should just not entertain. You should not go near it. You should not entertain it. All right? It will bring trouble. Okay, so you find yourself in entertaining these things, walking in sin, and it just takes a little bit to get there. That's the thing. A little compromise will take you a long way to sin. An example of this is if you know it's important to read the Word every day, to be in the Word every day, and you decide, I don't want to, or I can skip, or not this morning, and you compromise, and you compromise, you'll find that all of a sudden, weeks will go by, and you won't be in the Word. It's almost like when you tell yourself, like, I need to go to the gym, and next you know, like, ah, I'll go tomorrow, oh, I'll go tomorrow, oh, I'll go tomorrow. Next you know, a month went by. And it's the same thing when it comes to the Word. If you're not in the Word, time will come by, and it, it will, it, it can really cause a problem. The thing about this is, when we end up walking in sin, we separate ourselves from the presence of God. That's the problem. The problem is walking in sin, playing in sin, you will separate yourself from the presence of God. He will not leave you. All right? You give your life to Christ, you're covered by the blood, the Holy Spirit's living in you. He's not going to leave you, but you cut yourself off from everything He can bless you with. All right? Think of it like this, okay? It's like a husband and a wife, all right? Because the Lord, the, the Bible talks about our relationship with the Lord is like a husband and wife. That's what Ephesians 5 talks about. So think of a wife that won't divorce her husband. She's not going to leave her husband. She won't divorce her husband, right? They have made that commitment. But the husband goes out and he messes around with other women. He, he's just, he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. And he comes home and he just reeks of other perfume, he reeks of other things, and he comes home, do you think his wife will bless him with anything? Do you think his wife will bless him in any way in the bedroom? No. He robs himself of every blessing he can get. This is why it's so important when you recognize when you walk with Christ, you abide in Christ and he in you, and, and so therefore... You, you get that blessing. If you play in sin, you will rob yourself of everything God can give you. And listen, this is not prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel is garbage. It's this thing of you give into God's bank account, he'll give back. That's not this. Look, what it is is that you walk with Christ. It, it's, it's like I want to bless my wife because I love my wife. My wife wants to bless me because she loves me. And we have a relationship together that we talk to each other and we have those moments together that they're deep conversations. And it's the same thing with the Lord and that intimacy. It's that you talk to the Lord and He talks back to you. This is why a lot of people in the church and a lot of Christians are frustrated with the fact that they pray and they're like, I don't hear God. Well, why? What's stopping you from hearing Him? You're not reading. You're not reading. No relationship. There's no relationship. Or you're just rambling a grocery list and you're not taking time to listen. It would be like, if I came to Lance and I was just like, hey, man, what's up? And Lance tries to tell me his day and I just start rapping, 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 rapping. And Lance is like, I thought he wanted to know about what's going on with me. 
there's no, there's no really communication. I'm just talking and talking and talking. But Lance is not getting anything back. Do you have, there's a two-way conversation. To talk to the Lord is a two-way conversation. He will talk to you. And the thing is, you want to walk clear with God. You want to be able to be strong with the Lord. And you want to have a good relationship with Him. And you do this by being in the Word every day. You do this by prayer, by fellowship, by worshiping. And, and you feel His presence and He deals with your heart. Listen, if you're in the Word and you're getting nothing out of it, and I don't, and there's days where it's like, yeah, you'll read, and it's like, well, there wasn't really anything big that stood out, and that's okay. There's times like that. Still read, you know? But if you're finding it's getting difficult to read, you're finding that God's not talking to you, that He's not correcting you, you're finding that He's not dealing with your heart or the situations at hand, you have a problem. A problem has begun. You know, God will correct those who, who belong to him. And if God, if you're playing in sin and God stops correcting you, you got a big problem. You got a big problem. Because God's leaving you in that sin. You don't ever want to play in sin like that. Don't ever go near sin like that. Don't compromise. Stay away from it. Let God deal with your heart. All right? So look at the pattern now. Just to show you Isaac. He lied because he was what? Afraid. Afraid. He did not trust the Lord, so out of fear he lied. When he lied, he fell into what? Sin. And then it can bring a curse. It can bring a problem. But Jesus brings freedom. So I want to show you another piece here. The third part. Do you guys know that fearing people brings a snare? Fearing people brings a snare. It will entrap you to be in a nasty cycle to please everybody. That's the problem with fearing people. You'll want to please everyone. You won't know how to say no to things. You won't know how to stand for what's right. And you want to please people. Now, it may not be like someone like your neighbor, but think about this. It's like I, I told you guys before. You got a family member that you've been around. You can't say no to them. You know what they're asking you to do is not good. You know what they're asking you to do is not godly, but you just don't know how to say no because you're too afraid and you want to please them. You ever had that situation? Or maybe it's a really good friend that you just don't know what to do with, that you just don't know how to tell them no. They're always like, you want to go to Bible study? They want to come. You want them to come? They're like, no, I'm just, I'm just not into it, and I'd rather go to the movies. And you're like, okay, I'll skip this time. And you don't know how to tell them, no, I'm actually going to the Bible study. If you want to come, come. If you want to go to the movies, I'll go to the movies tomorrow. But I'm going to the Bible study. That's where I'll be at. You can find me there. That, I mean, you, you have to understand your ground. But sometimes it's really hard to do this with certain family and friends. That you have to learn to stand your ground this way. And you have to tell them this is what it is. But again, it brings that snare. So you always will get trapped in doing what that person wants constantly. Instead of saying, this is what the Lord wants me to do. Okay? This is what's important, to do what the Lord wants you to do. And you have to have wisdom in this. Okay? Wisdom. So, for example, let's say, I'll use, I'll use Mark and Tina, for example, because they're married. If Mark came to me and said, hey, man, I feel to be a called to a missionary in Ecuador. And I go, oh, is Tina excited about it? She's going with you? Oh, no, Tina's going to stay here for two years. I'm going to go by myself. I'm going to tell Mark, that's probably not from the Lord. The Lord is not going to separate your marriage for two years on this. All right? It will be something as a married couple, you will be in prayer together, you will be in agreement together, you will go together. Right? And that goes back to being equally yoked. You have to be equally yoked. So I want to show you some verses tonight. The verses are up here behind me and connecting what we're talking about tonight. All right? about just walking with the Lord and understanding that fear brings sin and then problems. Okay? Let me get a little drink here. Everybody turn to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29.
Proverbs 29, and we're going to look at verse 25. All right. Everybody there? Okay, here we go. Somebody else still looking for it? Everybody found it? Okay. Here's what it says, Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. So let me start with this one. Like I was explaining earlier, that snare can come in many forms. It can come in the form of compromising. It can come in the form of wanting to please them when you know it's not right. It can even come in the form of watching the media and getting so scared about what's going on in the world. You're constantly watching it. You're constantly freaking out. You're all like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And it will bring a snare. But you have to trust in the Lord. And then it says you shall be safe. So what you have to factor is this. No matter if it's major or small, trust the Lord and what he's doing and you will find security. Will you find trials? Yes, but he will give you security through the trial. See, the thing about following Jesus is this. He didn't say, come follow me, and I'm going to make it perfect, and you'll never go through anything. He said that it would be difficult. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, if any man come after me, he must pick up his cross and follow me. He said to lose his life is to gain it, and to gain his life is to lose it. And what you need to realize is that that snare comes because you fear people. You fear the situation, what people can do to you. And Jesus told us in the Gospels not to fear man who can kill the body, but to fear him who can both destroy body and soul in hell. You should fear God. You know, and, you know, maybe we've been through different trials. Maybe the biggest thing you've been through is a coworker that's giving you a hard time or a boss that's a real problem. But there are, you know, believers in Christ, there are fellow Christians that, man, they go through serious trials in the underground church overseas. They, they get tortured, they get arrested, they get separated from their family. I mean, in the Muslim countries, to become a Christian is an automatic death sentence. You know? And yet, here, we make it look like it's something else. And yet, over there, they know what it's going to come of it. Do not fear man. Trust the Lord. If you trust the Lord, you wouldn't be afraid. Do you know that? Do you know that perfect love casts out fear? Yes. And where fear is, there's torment. So why, why do people get in the church? Why do Christians who say they follow Jesus and have the Holy Spirit, why are they afraid? Why are they afraid? And look, I'm not talking like it's late at night, that's an alley, maybe I shouldn't go down. It's not the wisest thing to do. That's different, right? We're talking more of fear of like financial corruption or, or, or bankruptcy. We're talking fear of like what will happen to the kids. You have to trust the Lord. The, the Bible tells us our kids are arrows. We shoot them and we hope they hit the mark. Not literally shoot them. Don't shoot them, shoot them, right? Someone's going to misquote me on that. I went to the anchor and they said that I was supposed to shoot my children. No. Like they're arrows, right? You want to hit the mark. Do you know that to miss the mark when you're shooting arrows, you know what that's called? Sin. sin. To miss the mark means you sin. And so you want to train your child on the way to go. So when they're an adult, they won't depart from it. But it starts by not being afraid. And I think the other thing that happens is sometimes when our kids are getting older and things are happening and maybe they're rebelling, as parents, we become afraid. We want to negotiate with them. And sometimes you got to give them tough love and hope they land on their feet. I've been through it. It's not easy. Uh, let's look at Psalms 31. Turn to Psalms 31. And we're going to look at the first three verses. Psalms 31. So just go back one book from Proverbs, the Psalms. By the way, who's been reading their Bible on their own? Okay. That was a delay, wasn't it? <laughs> All right, good. Keep reading your Bibles. 
It's how you grow. All right, starting in verse 1, Psalms 31, verse 1. In you, O Lord, I will put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock and my refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your namesake, lead me and guide me. Now again, let's look at this, what David's saying here. He puts his trust in him, that he would never be ashamed, that he would be delivered by whose righteousness? The Lord's righteousness, not self-righteousness, not legalism, not having an appearance of holiness, but by God's righteousness. And then he says, bow down your ear to me, deliver me speedily. You ever felt like that? Lord, can, can you please just get me out of this quickly, please? Like, why do I have to go through it? Can we fix it by next weekend? Lord, I know it's Monday and it's rough at work, but if it could just be fixed by Friday, that would be great. Is that reality sometimes? No. And for guys, that's hard because we like to fix things. If we get in an argument with our wife, we want to fix it. We want to be like, so what did I say wrong? Or what did I do wrong? You know, and then you try to like fix it. I remember my, when I was, you know, my youth still married. Well, I'm married still, but <laughs> married my youth. I'm saying it backwards. Sorry. I'm like, you know, it's dyslexia. It's like a... It's like an atheist that lays in bed at night and wonders there's a dog in the world. He's a dyslexic atheist. Put it together. Anyway. No, no, sorry, that's a dog. Dyslexia means they flip the letters. He's wondering if there's a God, but he's dyslexic, so he wonders there's a dog. Sorry. See, this is why I don't tell jokes. So, all right. Now, my point is, when I was, when I was young, my marriage, I got married at 19 years old. Okay? I was 19 years old, came to Marine Corps. I actually got married at 18. Our son was four months old when I came to the Marine Corps. We were, me and my wife were young. My wife's three years older than me. So she was 21 when we got married. And, uh, or she was 20, 20 21. And, and you know, you, you're learning. And you learn what to say and not say. Now that I'm older, I know what not to say. I know what not to do. And even when you try to, like, you know, if you're young and you're still learning the Bible and you're trying to do it right, you know, and you get into this argument. I'm not saying this happened with us, but I'm just saying an example. And, and so you're like, you, your wife's furious about something you did or said, and, and it's just not communicating well. And you can't communicate well. And you go to her and you say, honey, we can't let the devil get a hold of us. Oh, I'm the devil now? Is that what you're saying? I'm the devil? Like, no, I'm not saying you're the devil. I'm saying the devil shouldn't get, you know, and it can go south. And we want to fix it, you know? And, and we want to be like, well, what did I say wrong? What did I do? And, and then, you know, some ladies do this. They're like, you know what you did. What? You know. <laughs> you know I'm not telling you. And you're like, listen, I used to tell my wife as a joke. I said, look, before we start that, I failed the mind reading MCI for the Marine Corps. So I don't know what you're thinking. <laughs> ladies, I'm letting you know the secret. Men do not know what you're thinking. <laughs> they cannot read your mind. All right. Sometimes we do things wrong and we don't even know what we did wrong. And our mind is like, it's not a big deal. And for you, it's like, I can't believe it. And you're thinking, <laughs> you're thinking like, did I, what did I do? And it, and it turns out it's something like you forgot the trash. <laughs> Just tell him, hey, you forgot the trash, take the trash out. And then get over it. You really want to be mad for 24 hours about trash? It's not worth it. All right? Just get over it. Just... As you get older, you learn this in marriage, and, and the thing is, you, you learn how to connect. And so David here, he wants, he wants the Lord to step in and, and help him immediately. Remember, David was being persecuted by, by Saul, King Saul, and it wasn't good. He was having a hard time about it. It got so bad for David at one point, he went to the Philistines and he played cuckoo because he had nowhere else to go. And he went to their gate and he was drooling on himself and playing cuckoo. You can read it in Samuel. And, and so they were like, oh, he lost his mind because he just didn't know what to do. He was always on the run, you know. Saul was always trying to kill him. One, at one moment, Saul would be normal, and then the next minute, Saul's throwing a spear at him to kill him. That's, that's, you think your boss is bad? Try dealing with a boss like that. Where your boss is like, 
Good job today. I really appreciate what you do. And then they try to shoot you. You know, it's not good. David goes on to say in verse 3, For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Think about this. For your name's sake, Lord. Not for mine, for yours. Because God's promises are his promises and he will complete them. So if God told you he'll do it, he'll do what? He'll do it. And the Bible is full of promises. That's why you need to read it. Because when you read it, not only does it correct you, not only does it go in and wash you, the washing of the word. Ladies, you want, if you're married, you want your husband to wash you in the word, to go through the word and wash you. You know, men, you, if you're not doing this with your wife, you need to do this. If you're dating, you need to do this. It's a, it's a, it's a place to start. You need to go through the Bible together. The Holy Spirit will deal with you as you go through it, and it will, he will correct you. And the thing is, is you will find just the same that God will become your rock and your fortress. All right? And again, for his name's sake, because he promised it. This is the same thing that happened with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt and Exodus, when everything was going crazy, and Moses was like, just take me. I will be eternally punished that they... They will survive because God was like, I'll, I'll raise up a new nation out of you. You know, he's testing Moses, but the reality is, is that it's for God's name's sake that he holds us, that he makes the promise to us, all right? And you know, there's groups that try to teach that, like, God doesn't want the Jews anymore or he replaced the Jews. That's not the case. There is a separation between the Jews and the church. God is still working with the Jewish community. He's going to bring them in, in in the last days in the Great Tribulation. But the thing you have to understand, this, this is the danger in that mindset. Because if you believe God replaced Israel, how long before he replaces you then? That's the danger in that mindset. All right? It's called replacement theology. It's very dangerous. It's a very dangerous mindset. There is, there is, God loves both. And he says that God is, Grafted us in, where the wild, the, the Gentiles, the wild branch, grafted in. Okay. Now, let's go to Psalm seventy-one. Psalm seventy-one again, verses one through three. All right, give you guys a second to get there. It says, in you, O Lord, I put my trust. Again, look what he's saying. David, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Same thing being said as the other one. Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong refuge to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandment to save me. The commandment of God is what? It's a promise. He commands it. He'll do it. He's not. He's going to he's going to make it happen for you are my rock and my fortress It's the same thing. Again, in Psalm 71, he's talking about trusting the Lord. The Lord is his rock and his fortress. The Lord is holding him that nothing is going to move him from here, that he knows the commandments going to save him. You ever have to deal with someone where you told them you're going to do it and they're like, hey, when are you going to do it? And they're like, I told you I'm going to do it. The frustrating thing can happen is if you deal with a person that says they'll do it and they never do it. And then they never do it and then they never do it. And then you're just kind of like, well, they don't really do this. So I'm going to move on. But God is not like this. God, when he says he's going to do it, he will do it. If he says he'll protect you, he'll protect you. If he says he'll provide for you, he'll provide for you. This is what you have to understand, ladies and gentlemen. God will always provide for you. So let's say you're praying. You're like, Lord. We need food. I need food. I, I'm, I'm low on cash. I need food. I need groceries. Whether you have kids or you don't have kids, whatever it is, right? And then the Lord provides burgers and hot dogs for you at your house, right? Some of you are like, amen to that. But some people sometimes when they're praying about it, they're like, Lord, I meant like a steak dinner. Sometimes it's not what, what you think it is. Lord, I need transportation. I need a car. So he gives you a 2003 Chevy Malibu. And you're like, no, Lord, I meant like a 2018, a 2022, a hybrid, electric car. 
Because you don't need it. He knows you don't need it. He will give you exactly what you need because he knows your character and how you're going to think and how you're going to function. You ever ask this question to yourself? Why does this individual seem to do well financially? I'm not talking about being super rich. They do well financially. And I struggle. You ever ask that? And then you go to some groups and they're like, it's because you're not giving to the church and you're being punished. Is that the case? No. That's not the case at all. Here's the thing. I used to, I used to, I used to wonder that sometimes. But then I think about what James says. You ask amiss because you ask because you lust for pleasure. In other words, sometimes the Lord knows if I give you this amount of money, you're not going to use it like you're supposed to. You're not going to provide for your family and you're not going to see the needs in the church and help people or the needs when someone's hungry. You're just going to go blow it on garbage or alcohol or stupidity or sin. And that's why sometimes it's held at a halt. The other times it can be is because the Lord is saying, you don't fully trust me. I want you to know what it's like to trust me. When I learned to trust the Lord, I learned he was faithful through and through. I learned that he provided through and through. You know, I remember moving out to Escondido. We were doing a military ministry here. It was growing. Uh, we were looking for a place at the time I was getting out of Wounded Warriors. And the base was doing this thing where if you were like retiring out of Wounded Warriors, you can live on base still. You could be out of the Marine Corps. You could just pay rent and you can live. That. And we we're like, man, that would be perfect. Like we could stay right here. We don't have to move. The ministry is right here because we work on base, everything. And, and one minute they would be like, yeah, yeah. And then they go, no. Then like, yeah, it's going to work. No. And they would just constantly. Yes. No. Yes. No. And finally, we were like, man, we got to find a place to live. So we started going around looking from house to house here, what to rent. We couldn't find anything in Oceanside. And, we, you know, and I'm thinking in my mind, I'm like, we got to find Oceanside area. Carlsbad's too expensive to rent because I, I had a staff sergeant that I knew, a uh, friend that he rented over there. The guy had like a one-bedroom apartment was paying $3,000. And I'm like, yo, I can't afford you know, $3,000 for one bedroom. <laughs> it's just him and his dog in a one-bedroom paying $3,000. And I was like, no way. So we're looking around Oceanside. We're trying to figure it out. We're looking at houses. Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. And finally, we, we go to see this house, you know, and, and the lady who's showing the house, really, she's a Christian, and she, she finds out what I do, and she's like, hey, I got this showing in Escondido at this house. I want you to come check it out. It might be what you need. And I said, okay, I'll go check it out. And you got to understand, before I, I lived in Escondido, Driving to Escondido was like, that's the other side of the world, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it felt far away. Like, we used to joke because we'd go to Vallarta's, and I'd be like, that's, that's way over there in Escondido. And now it's like hop, skip, and a jump, you know? And so here's what happened. We go to look at this house, and we're looking at it, and right away I feel the Holy Spirit go, this is for you. And I was struggling. It was, I was struggling. I was having a Gideon moment. And even though I felt clearly the Lord said this for you, I was like, Lord, if this is really for me, the rent's got to come down to this amount. She's got to be willing to take all three dogs, the lady who owned the house. And, and I forget what the third thing was. What was the third thing? It was the dogs, the rent, and something else. And so we're there, and obviously I talked to the lady, and I, this is what we're doing, da 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 and so she's like, okay, wrote the name down. All these, and there were people writing their names and putting offers for the rent and everything. And I'm like, man, I got to get this house. And so I go to dinner with a friend, and that night she calls, and she goes, listen, um, I think you should rent the house. I'm going to bring it down to X amount of dollars, and all three dogs are welcome. In fact, you can move in immediately. And I was like, okay, Lord. So the Lord is faithful. He tells me. He's faithful to show me, okay? We get moved in, and, and, and I remember, like, the day we get moved in, I still had to teach a Bible study. It was a Friday. Like, they packed up our house, base housing. We moved over there. I'm still in the Marine Corps, but I'm still teaching a Bible study. I'm, like, at the very end of everything. 
and, and the enemy came in, man, all of a sudden, they went from like, oh, man, man, like, you do your internship, da, 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 it's really cool, to like, we need you here every day, and like, dude, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, my kids are in elementary school over there, and I just, I got one of the worst senior staffs that all of a sudden just, I don't know what his deal was, and he was just making life crazy for me, and I, and I went to the Lord, and I'm like, Lord, you gotta help me, and he, he helped me, and here's the crazy part of the Lord's faithful and faithful, faithful, and faithful. And I still remember sitting at the dinner table and I started crying and I'm like, Lord, how am I supposed to do the ministry? It's so far away. This doesn't make sense. Why did you bring me to Escondido when everything's happening on the base? I don't get it. Why would you take me the opposite direction that I'm, I'm thinking in my mind I'm supposed to go? This doesn't make sense. Everything's happening on Camp Pendleton and you take me to Escondido. And I was so frustrated. It made no sense until the Lord opened the door for San Diego Christian College. And I met Ruben Calderon. And all of a sudden, Ruben was a combat vet that was in the Army living in Escondido. We hit it off. We started carpooling. And the Lord took what I thought the ministry should be at a Camp Pendleton and expanded it out to North County and to North San Diego. He had a bigger plan. But in my mind, I was like, Lord, it doesn't make any sense. I couldn't see it. But the Lord knew. And you know, the Lord is faithful in the whole thing. He's gentle like a dad that gets it because he's like, I told you. And I still was like, ah, I showed you. Ah. And even like in my frustration. And then on top of all this, ladies and gentlemen, we're in the house. We're there. I'm working here. We're doing the ministry. We're getting it all rolling. And then I'm noticing, man, rent's coming up and the money's getting short fast. And I was like, God, I don't know what to do. I, I, we need to pay the rent. We need to pay the rent. We need to pay the rent. And God loves to show up and do miracles. And rent's due in five days. Rent's due in four days. Rent's due in three days. Rent's due in two days. Rent's due mañana. <laughs> 11.30 p.m., here's a check for the rent. I was like, okay, God, I trust you. I get it. I will follow you. 100%. That was me going to Escondido. So. So. Let's go to Psalms 125. All right, verses 1 and 2. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. This is an amazing verse. Think about this. All right. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. What is Mount Zion? What holy mountain? But what is it? It's God's holy mountain. It's his holy mountain, okay? And it says that they will not be moved. They cannot be moved. It abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. Do you understand that God surrounds you like that? He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. If you're in Christ, you have given your life to Jesus. You have asked him to come in your life. You are free, and he will surround you. If you play in sin you won't feel his presence. But if you follow him and abide in him, you'll feel him there. You'll know he's there. He will not leave you even if you mess up because his grace is abundant. What you'll learn is, I don't want to play in this sin anymore. I hate this sin. I don't want to be near this sin. I want to do something else. I want to be close to Jesus. So here's the thing. When you put your trust in the Lord, he will protect you. He will surround you, and he will be your fortress. 
The Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what Romans tells us. Nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers can separate us from the love of God. This is Romans chapter 8. He will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. But you have to trust in the Lord. You have to teach your children the same. If you have children, teach them to trust the Lord. You don't have kids, but you got little nieces and nephews. Teach them to trust the Lord. Teach your little brother, your little sister, whoever it is that the Lord has put you in front of to trust the Lord. And there's two ways you can do it. You can verbally talk to them through it, and you, you can live it, and they can watch it. Now, depending on their age, there's lots of ways to go about it. There's Superbook. For, for Superbook works for, for full-grown Marines. I've had Marines sit back there and watch Superbook and learn from it. You know? And yet... Isaiah's four years old, and he could tell you the stories that come out of Superbook from listening to it. So whether you're four years old or 40 years old, you can learn from Superbook. All right? You're never too old to learn from it. It's the Bible done really well. You know, it's kind of like when the Bible miniseries came out. You remember that years ago? I think it was like 2000, I want to say six, not even 16, 2013. It was like back in the day. It was almost... Ten years ago, the Bible miniseries came out, and I remember we watched it. I was curious about how they would do the whole Bible, and I remember sitting with some pastors, and they were like, I didn't really like it. It wasn't that good. And I was like, well, the book's better. <laughs> the book is always better. So, listen, you have to trust the Lord. Teach your children to trust the Lord, okay? See, the thing is, Isaac, he did just like his father did a hundred years before him. Abraham gave a half-truth, and Isaac blatantly lied because he didn't trust God. If you walk in sin, you can end up causing your spouse to walk in sin. Do you know this? If you're married men, if you walk in sin, you'll cause your spouse to walk in sin. Their wives will hold their ground and say, hey, uh-uh, I'm not doing that, but... Wives want to please their husbands, and sometimes they will compromise into sin just to keep the peace in the house, and you never want that. You are accountable because you are the high priest of your household. You are to lead your family, men, and if you are not teaching them the word, you're not teaching them how to walk in Christ, you're accountable for it. Just like me being a pastor, I'm accountable for what I teach you. If I teach you incorrectly and I lead you astray, I'm accountable for it. That's why pastors are held doubly accountable. And when you have all these pastors that are famous and on TV or they're teaching false doctrine or they're messing with people, they're going to be accountable for leading people astray, making people believe things are okay that are not. And the thing is, is as pastors, we got to do it in love and that they grow. But men, you are that to your household. If you're single, you still need to learn it. You know, if you're single, man, and you're learning this and you're growing in this, you will then, when it's time to find a spouse, you'll be ready. The only thing you have to learn is how her character is and, you know, what buttons not to push. You know, and then it, it will already set in because if you tell her, hey, I really want to go through the word with you. I really want to grow with you in the word. That's the thing. Now, gentlemen, if you're dating a woman and you tell her that, she's like, ah, I'm really not into that. That's your thing. That's a massive red flag, and you might want to snip that. And ladies, if you've been reading the Word, and you've been growing the Word, and you're single, and you're like, oh, man, I hope he's godly, and I want him to lead me through the Word, and he's like, no, no, that's, that's your thing. I, I'm not into that. You, it's time to go, all right? If you're dating, cut it off, because you're not going to change him. You can't change him, all right? So now, the other thing here, we're all bringing this to a close. So a... Isaac blatantly lied. <clears throat> so walk in sin, you can destroy your family, all right? You can cause your children to learn how to sin in new ways that you never even knew. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about, okay? So this actually happened to my uncle. This actually happened to my uncle. My uncle had a cocaine problem. He lived in El Salvador. He had a big-time cocaine problem. He was doing cocaine all the time. And one day, his... This is when his daughter was really young. She was about four or five years old. She went up to him and said, Daddy, I had a dream last night. And in my dream, I saw all this white powder on a table, and I was putting it up my nose, but I don't know what it is. 
and the Lord straight up told my uncle, you keep playing with cocaine, she will have an addiction to cocaine as well. You can, you can cause this to come down the line to your children. Jesus breaks those things. The blood of Jesus breaks curses. The blood of Jesus breaks generational curses and sin. But if you play in sin, if you teach your children certain things, you can cause them to sin. And, and sometimes we don't even realize we're doing it. Sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Sometimes you can think to yourself, oh, it's just an innocent movie. I'm not saying don't go to the movies. That's what I'm saying. You got to know what movie you're taking your kid to. Oh, it's just an innocent movie. It's just a little kid at this Hogwarts place. Yeah, they're just kids. They're doing real spells because the author was a real witch that taught real witchcraft and put real spells in the book and in the movie. And now you got this five-year-old or six-year-old who's like, oh, man, this is so cool. And can we get one of those things that he has? And learns to repeat. And now they're opening doors and they're opening doors and they're opening doors. You have to be very careful. Let me, let me tell you like this, okay? So I learned this myself. My son was very little. The Lord had pulled me out of darkness. I still had that movie that I'm describing. I'm, all right? You guys know what movie I'm talking about? Harry Potter? Okay. I still had it in the house. I, I had the collection. I was, I was, Lord was pulling me out of darkness. And I noticed one day my son is mimicking and building something and mimicking it. And I had just started following the Lord. And in the middle of the night, the Lord woke me up and said, grab that thing and break it and throw it in the trash. I got rid of all that. But out of ignorance, sometimes we don't know what we're doing. And it's very dangerous. It, we can open doors that we don't understand. So you have to be careful. All right? <clears throat> what will happen, ladies and gentlemen, is if, if you decide, I want to compromise and sin here and there, and then you teach... Your kids, ah, it's not a big deal. We'll just, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, it's, and you compromise and compromise. You can cause that child to be an adult that will reject the Lord and now teach a new generation sin. And they'll teach a new generation sin and teach a new generation. And once you build enough that you teach them how to do things, guess what happens to a society? You got a problem. But if, as a parent, you hold your ground and say, as for us, we'll serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. And you teach them the word of God and you plant the seed of the word of God. And then even if they may stray, because some of us were those kids who ran away and came back. And then you teach your kids and they teach their kids and their kids. You get a new generation. You get a new group of people that learn the Lord. This is what the book of Judges said that. The judge would be there. They would do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. The judge would die, and everyone would do right in their own eyes, and they would go right back into captivity. Now, to close tonight, I want everybody to turn to Exodus 34. And this is what it says. And the, Lord, and the Lord passed before him, this is Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So Moses made haste and bowed his head towards the earth and worshiped. Then he said, If I now have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people and pardon our iniquities and our sin and take us as your inheritance. Here's the thing. Maybe you're stiff-necked. Maybe you're, you're the most bullheaded person you ever knew. You're, you're the person that sees the bear trap. You've been, you've been held. The bear trap has been taken off your leg just to come right back and be like, it's on my face now. Because you, you just don't learn and you like to go right back to where you were. Because you think you know better. Stiff-necked. 
But I'm telling you right now, Jesus, Jesus is the one that will set you free. So tonight, here's how I want to end this. I want to offer you all Jesus if you've never given your life to Christ. If you're online watching, I want to offer you Jesus. And the other thing I want to do, if you have given your life to Christ, but you are struggling or you're recognizing your family struggling or you're recognizing that there is a generational problem, I want to anoint you tonight with oil and I want to pray for you that it would be broken and that there would be freedom. That no longer sin would grip your life or no longer it would grip your marriage. But complete freedom. It may be that it came down through the family. It may be that it was something that maybe grandpa initiated and dad had it and now you struggle in it. It could be something that great grandma to grandma to mom to you. But I want you to know tonight you can be set free. And if you're watching online, you can be set free. You just have to ask the Lord to set you free. But I want to pray for you that you would be set free. So. Before we close, I recognize every face here, pretty much. And I know how you guys walk with Christ. But if you've never given your life to Christ, if you're online watching, you never give your life to Christ, tonight's the night to do it. The Bible says tomorrow's not promised to you. And tonight's the night to get right. So if you're online, here's what I want you to do. I want you, if you're watching, I want you to... <clears throat> Type in and say, I want to give my life to Christ. If you're listening to this later, this recording, then this is all you have to do is pray and ask the Lord to come in your life. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lead you in this prayer for those who are online or in this room that want to give their lives to Jesus. You pray from your heart. The ground's not going to open up. The sky's not going to open up. This is not some magical thing that you say. This is between you and the Lord and making it right. <coughs> Excuse me. And then... If you're like, believe I gave my life to Christ, I've just been struggling, then I want to pray that you're free. I want to pray that you find real freedom in Jesus. So, for those tonight who want to give their lives to Christ, who are listening online, pray this prayer. It goes like this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. I'm asking you to come into my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, and I will live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're watching online and you've done that, and I want you to reach out to us. I want to get a Bible in your hand. I want to get you plugged in because we have people watching from all over. If you're listening to this recording, and, it's, and, and David's already posted it, write in. Go to our website, right, and say, hey, I was listening to that, and I gave my life to Christ. I would love to hear that. Because it says, all heaven rejoice when, when one sinner is redeemed, when the Lord gets a hold of one. They, they go, wow, there's a party in heaven. They're like, woo, right? But tonight, if you're dealing with brokenness, you're dealing with, you're trapped, or you feel like, man, I can't be break free of this sin, or man, I, I, I watched my dad go through this, and now I'm going through it, or I watch. My family go through this. I don't care if it's drugs, alcohol, pornography, hatred. I want you to be free tonight. All right. So let me pray for you guys. Lord Jesus, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus. For those who have been struggling, for those who just feel like they can't overcome certain sins, that they feel like there's just been this generational thing that's followed them. Lord, even for those who, who tell themselves, I'll never do this again just to do it again the next day. Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would set them free, that we plead the blood of Jesus over their life, and we pray for a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit to move upon their life and to break every chain, Lord God, that the, the, any addiction of drugs, alcohol, pornography, whatever it is, be broken in the name of Jesus. We pray right now that if there's any demonic things that have come down the line from the family, anything that has, any family member that has had any family members in the occult, that that would be broken in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray for their kids. So if there's anyone here tonight that they're just struggling, that their kids are having a hard time, Lord God, we pray that you would keep your hand upon those children, that you would set them free, and that they would come to know you in a very real way. 
And Lord God, if there's anyone here tonight that has a prodigal, whether they're online or in here, or they just their son has been or daughter has been running from the Lord, I pray that you would draw them in, that you would set them free, and you would heal them. Lord, I pray right now, Lord, for healing physically and mentally and emotionally for those who need it. And Lord, I just pray, Lord God, that you would just move in power upon each person that they would walk in your word, abide in your word, and Lord God, that they would know you more and more. I pray for the marriages here tonight, that the husbands would lead their wives, they would wash their wives in the word. I pray that you would heal anything, Lord God, that has hindered the marriage, that has caused emotional damage in the marriage. But Lord, I pray right now that you would just keep these marriages strong in your name. And Lord, I pray for anyone watching online tonight that you would just help them, Lord. I pray for any of the kids that are sick. Lord God, that you would heal them, that you would help in any stomach issues. Lord God, and I just pray, Lord God, right now that they would just have freedom, Lord. And I pray for the brokenhearted and the lonely, Lord God, that you would heal them. And that they would come to know their value in you and how much you love them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So, at this point, are there any questions online or in the room about what we discussed? Yes. Uh, and I will repeat it for those who are online so they can hear it. Okay, so my question has to do with fear and anxiety. Fear and anxiety, yes. Yes, so anxiety can be brought on by fear, and anxiety can be an emotional or physical reaction to the fear. But the Bible tells us in Timothy that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of uh, love, courage, and a sound mind. And perfect love, perfect love casts out fear. So anxiety can be brought upon it, and you just have to know that God's love and the Holy Spirit gives you the power to overcome that anxiety and fear. Yes. My other question has to do with the context of the Hebrew terminology for heart. Because in America, what I've seen, and me and my wife discussed this yesterday, uh, we were talking about like how how do we interpret heart? And we just strictly go with feelings. Mm -hmm. But we came to the, the idea of like, you know, we looked into it and in the Hebrew way, it's called it's your thoughts. Well, your okay, thoughts. so the heart in Hebrew is called leb. Right, Leb. And so with emotions and feelings, emotions can deceive. People people say things like, Well, if it feels good, it can't be that bad. Right. But that's not true. And so sometimes there's that illusion and a lot of sometimes churches get into what's called emotionalism yeah. where they get everybody worked up yeah. and then you know, and then they, they get something out of it. But the 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 Hebrew word about the heart, Leb, means what controls the inside or the house inside. In other words, like what Jesus said, it's what comes out of the mouth yeah. that reveals what's in the heart, right? right? So when the Lord deals with your heart, yes, we have our physical heart that pumps. But when he deals with you in, in your internal person, your spirit, right. you change the way you think. And then you react if your character change and you reflect Jesus. Right. And that's what I was saying. I was thinking like it's the whole package. It's your thinking too. Yes. It You're changes. Correct. It changes your thinking. It changes however how you are, but it's the internal thing that's being transformed. Yeah. So. Yep. Any questions online, Joseph? Can you check? I checked again. So, any other questions? No. Okay. So, if we have none online and none in here, um, be blessed. Have a great weekend. I think there's leftover food, and. Um, and I'll answer any questions on the side. And if you need more prayer, let me know, okay? Have a blessed weekend.